All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar about the profession of optometry. We're really glad that you are here with us, that you have a few minutes to spend um, hearing all about what optometry offers as a potential career choice. So we hope this is really helpful for you as you're thinking about all your options and envisioning what your future might hold in um, the healthcare profession. Uh, my name is Rebecca Griffin. I'm the Student Services and Admissions Officer here at the college, and I'm really happy uh, today to have with me Dr. Jeanette Dumas, who is one of our uh, faculty members here. She also has a role in our admissions and recruiting department, um, and she's just really great. She's a student favorite, so she's going to do the majority of the talking since she's the subject matter expert. And of course, we are happy to answer any sort of questions you have. Um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on your questions along the way, but certainly if we don't have a breath or a, a, a moment where we can pause and answer your question while we're in it, we will we'll address all those questions at the end. We'll also be recording the session and posting it to our YouTube page as we do with all of our webinars. And I can share uh, the PowerPoint slides after the fact so you don't have to worry about screenshotting them or scribbling down notes or anything like that. So um, without any further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Dumas to get started. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about the profession of optometry. It's something that I am truly excited and passionate about. So hopefully this can pique your interest even more about our profession. All right, so what is optometry? So first, this is the technical term. Optometrists are medical professionals who diagnose and treat diseases and dysfunction of the visual system. However, usually what I like to ask everyone, or just to think about since this is a webinar, um, how many of you actually wear glasses and contact lenses? And those of you that do, you know what it's like to be able to see, and you know what it's like not to be able to see. Um, eye care professionals impact so many different people because we're able to enhance quality of life of everyone. There are not very many professions out there that, that do not need us. So usually when people come to see us, they're excited, they're happy, they are um, grateful that they'll either get some new glasses or they can change their eye color or what have you. So, but one downside of optometry is that when people think about it, they think it's just glasses and contact lenses. And so to some, that can seem a little boring. So I want to talk to you guys more about how to um, look at optometry as a whole and not just glasses and contacts. So um, what is optometry? So we practice in more than uh, 600 communities in the U.S. We provide 70% of the eye care and vision services. We recognize that responsible quality eye care must involve the patient's total health. So again, that's some of the um, factual things about optometry. Uh, what we're going to delve into a little bit more is how does optometry uh, stand out as a profession, okay? I'm going to hold okay. just one second. I can see where our slides are kind of cutting off here. So just give oh. us one moment and I'll make a quick fix. That's what they're going to. All right. And we're yeah. back. All right. Good deal. So let's move into the next slide. All right. So more than glasses and contact lenses. So this is the meat that I wanted to get at too. So this is what I want you guys to think about. Um, when you are um, reading, do you ever, um, when you're looking at the words and stuff, do the words ever move around? Okay, just think about that. Or when you're reading, um, when you're looking at the words, does it seem to kind of go in focus, go out of focus, that sort of thing? Or even um, how many of you ever get headaches when you read? Just think about that. Or the last thing is, um, have you ever been reading a paragraph and you think you're on the next line, but no, you're reading that same paragraph, okay? Now, let's relate that to if you're eight years old and you got all four of those symptoms, are you gonna want to read? Yeah, no, <laughs> so not <laughs> one are gonna want to read. What you're gonna do is you're gonna mess with the person right next to you because reading is a chore, it's not fun. So 
sometimes patients that are diagnosed with ADHD actually do not have ADHD. They have a vision issue. The reason why your eyes aren't coming together as a team is because the brain is giving the information to the eyes that's a little erroneous. So what we do as optometrists, we have a section of optometry that's called vision therapy, where we train you to use your eyes better as a team. There's another section where we can work with traumatic brain injury patients. So what does that exactly mean? Have you ever experienced or been around someone that's had a stroke? If you have, think about this, how many of them are the exact same after the stroke than what they were before the stroke. Exactly. Most of them are not the same. And the, and the reason is because when they had that traumatic brain injury, something got jumbled in the brain. And a lot of times it jumbles where the vision is located in the occipital lobe. So what does all of that mean? It means that there's patients that have had a stroke that have come out and say that they are, that they can't see, but when we check their vision, they see 2020. And so what we can do in vision therapy is we can help them to restructure how they process visual information so that their vision is just as or is improving as compared to when they first had the stroke. We also work with uh, refractive surgery. So we don't actually do the refractive surgery, but what we can do is get patients ready for refractive surgery and then do their care after refractive surgery. We have a specialty in contact lenses. Now I'm gonna pause right there because when I was in high school and college, I thought contact lenses were easy because you just get a pair of Accuviews and you're good. But no, there's a whole nother world of contact lenses that um, we can enhance patients' quality of life. Specifically, have you ever seen somebody that's had a scar in their eye and you just keep looking at that scar and you're like, I know I don't need to look at it, but <laughs> I can't help it. Well, what you can do with a contact lens is put a, another contact lens on the eye that matches the good eye so that it is um, uh, covered and that's not drawing attention so that the patient feels a little bit more confident as they're moving about and stuff like that. So those are some areas of optometry that aren't highlighted as much that you um, that we see out there, but we change patients' lives. Another area that we're going to discuss is just the disease component. Optometrists or I should say this, eye care professionals is the only profession that can see, the side, can see inside of the body without cutting the body open. Now, how do we do that? Dilation. Now think about it. When you guys got your eyes checked, how many of you actually got dilated? So dilation means that they put drops inside of your eye, make your pupils really, really wide, and then the optometrist shine a really bright light in your eye, okay? Now, why is this important? Patients that have diseases, specifically diseases that are vascular, meaning that they are affected by the blood vessels, are going to show up on dilation. So, for example, everyone has heard of diabetes, right? It's basically where you have a lot of bl high blood sugar. And so if the vessel isn't um, or if the vessel is compromised by di diabetes, we can see it. If the vessel is compromised by high blood pressure, we can see it. If the vessel, or not even the vessel, if the patient has cancer, we can see some cancers inside of the eye. We can tell if a patient has sickle cell anemia. We can tell if a patient has high cholesterol by just looking inside of their eye. So there's so many different things that optometrists are able to uncover that the patient has no idea what's going on. So they'll come to us and say that they can't see, but then when we look inside of the eye, we're like, oh, Oh, I see why you can't see. You have signs of high blood pressure or you have signs of diabetes and so forth. So that's one way where optometrists are uh, invaluable in helping patients um, lead better and healthier lives. So that's more the disease aspect. And I've already talked about contact lenses and pediatrics. I'm actually a pediatric optometrist. So I see patients um, 18 and under. And actually in that picture, that's me examining one of my students' young, young daughters there, okay? So that's a fascinating area because with the little babies, you can't ask them which is better, one or two. So you have to figure out different ways to determine what their visual acuity and their uh, prescription is and so forth. Then on the totally other end, there's geriatrics. Um, so 
that's an, another exciting area in optometry along with developmental vision and developmental vision is what I was talking about with the vision therapy and stuff and then low vision and rehabilitation. One aspect that I didn't talk about, which is actually up and coming is sports vision, meaning, um, for example, so um, Southern College of Optometry is the official eye care provider for the University of Memphis. So what that means is their athletes and things of that nature, we're able to enhance their vision and give them a better edge on competitors by enhancing their reaction time, by enhancing their peripheral awareness, by enhancing their eye movements and things of that nature. So this is a whole new exciting thing. And we're so excited because Penny is the new coach. Y'all know Penny Hardaway. But anyway, I'm sorry, I digress. But that's um, what we do as optometrists. So this next slide I'm gonna show you is gonna ask, require you to think a little bit, okay? So when we talked about dilation, this is what we look at when we look inside of the eye. So you have the optic nerve, okay? You have the macula. So the macula is where you see 2020, okay? So we make sure that looks healthy. Um, if you've heard of somebody that has macular degeneration, this is the area where they're having issues, okay? The optic nerve connects the eye to the brain. So if there's something going on in the brain, then sometimes we can see it in the optic nerve. For example, sometimes we'll see that optic nerve swollen. If it's swollen, then we have to rule out if there's any swelling in the brain. The next part, so with A, the, the blood vessel right there is an artery, okay? And with B, the blood vessel, the darker blood vessel is a vein. So this is how we can tell if you have high cholesterol. We can see the lipid, the fatty deposits inside those blood vessels, okay? So this is all helping us determine if your eye is healthy or not, okay? So I want you to keep this stuff in mind because you're going to see this again. Oops. So again, so I talked about how we treat more than glasses and stuff. So we do treat, or we have more than glasses. So we do treat ocular disease. Right there is a sty. When I moved to Memphis to start my residency in pediatrics, um, they called them stars. And I was like, what are y'all talking about? I don't know what a star is, but they're basically trying to say a sty. And so it's also, it's just a pimple that's on your eyelid or what have you. And so, um, so we do that, no problem, but we also treat disease. So with this disease here, this is what I wanted to get you guys to kind of look at. So this is the healthy eye. This is the not healthy eye. Okay. And I'm going to tell you the difference between the two. The non-healthy eye is a diabetic um, eye. OK, and the reason why you see all these blood vessels and stuff that these hemorrhages and stuff is because when there's high blood sugar in the eye or in the blood vessels, the blood doesn't flow like it should. And when it doesn't flow, then it can't reach the tissues. When it can't reach the tissues, then the brain is like, well, we got to get some blood vessels. We got to get blood to these these tissues somehow. So it develops new blood vessels, but those blood vessels leak. And so when you see all of these hemorrhages and stuff, that's the leaky areas there, okay? So this eye is not as healthy as the other eye. So this is why if you know somebody with diabetes, please have them to get their eyes checked because they can't feel this. They can't tell that this is going on. The only way they can know is if we see them, all right? All right. So that's one aspect. So now let's talk about the optometrist and ophthalmologist. So these are the two um, um, doctoral eye care professionals, all right? So we have optometrists and we have ophthalmologists. Here's the difference. So, or let's say, let's talk about the same. If you come to me and you have a sty, I'm going to give you the same treatment, the same medications as the ophthalmologist. There's nothing different there. If you come to me and you say you want LASIK surgery, I'm going to examine you and say, hey, you're probably a good candidate. Let me refer you to somebody. The ophthalmologist will be the one that actually does the surgery. OK, what's the difference between the two? Optometrists go to optometry school for four years. Ophthalmologists actually go to medical school. So ophthalmologists um, are in a medical school format. With optometrists, we have an option to do a one year residency. So once you graduate after four years, you're not required to do a residency, but about a third of our students do a residency. OK, in ophthalmology, you got to do a three year residency. Okay, plus a year of internship. So, 
even after that, you may even have to do different fellowships and stuff to specialize in different areas of ophthalmology or what have you. So you just go to school a lot longer with ophthalmology versus with optometry. So what does that mean? So in high school, you would expect to have eight more years of schooling to be an optometrist, four of undergrad, four of optometry school. For ophthalmology, it means that when you uh, graduate high school, you need to expect at least 12 more years of, of schooling, okay? So the big difference why people choose one over the other is sometimes it can be the amount of schooling. If you want to do similar things but yet not go to school as long, then do an optometrist. If you're willing to go the, the extra mile and keep it going because you want to do more surgical procedures, then do optometry, okay? We're going to talk about the salary difference because it is significant. <laughs> But it's still good, but it is significant, okay? And I want you to think about, it. does anybody know how much optometrists make versus ophthalmologists? If you don't, it's okay. We're going to talk about it. I feel like I'm, I kind of got you guys uh, hanging right here. So let me just say this, all right? Optometrists make about on average anywhere between 120, 150, even up to 170-ish, okay? K, okay? Ophthalmologists, you probably want to double that. Okay, so about 300. Okay, okay. The big difference is surgery versus not surgery. Okay, but they're both doctors and stuff. Okay, all right. Different types. So, modes of practice. So, this is the other thing. People, when they think about the eye doctor, I don't know if they, which type of mode of practice they think, but there's several different types of practice. You can own your own practice. You can be in a partnership with a group practice, with a group of optometrists. Um, you can be in a group practice with an ophthalmologist and optometrist. You can do the military or even public health settings, uh, retail or optical. So retail would be like lens crafters or Walmart opticals, that sort of thing. You can do academia. Um, HMOs, um, all sorts of things, corporate, industrial settings, that's more so like if you want to work for Johnson or Johnson & Johnson or work for Alcon and developing contact lenses and stuff like that. So there's so many different modes of practice you can do for optometry. It's more so about your personality and what you want to do to, um, to decide which mode of practice would be best for you, okay? Um, this is getting into the stuff I was kind of talking to you guys about as far as the net income and stuff. Um, that income rate is a lot higher when you decide to work for yourself. So just keep that in mind. All right. Um, we optometrist is actually a good field because you can work as much as you want to work. Okay. Um, you can set your own hours. You can set your own pace. The other thing about just eye care in general, there are not a lot of life-threatening, or excuse me, life-threatening, sight-threatening conditions. So for the most part, we don't kill people, okay? So we're basically trying to save vision and stuff. So a lot of times people that don't, uh, that want to enhance quality of life without danger of actually hurting someone for the rest of their life is really next is really really a small amount our malpractice insurances is not nearly as high actually ours is less than ophthalmology because we're not doing surgery so ours is definitely one of the um uh, smaller rates of of malpractice insurance and stuff like that um we are always on the those best job lists either with uh, U.S. News and World Report or Indeed or what have you. It's just that because our quality of life is great, um, we you you can set your hours, you can work part time if you wish and still make nice money. So it just all depends on what you want to do um, in your personal career to decide how you want to implement optometry. All right, and so this is the other thing that I've kind of talked about throughout the whole thing. One thing I didn't stress is that we're not on call as many as many um, professions are, okay? And um, we do have some on call. I don't want you to think that we're never on call, but it's not nearly as stressful as some other professions. And 
I have a question for you guys. What do you think is when when do you think throughout the year will be the highest time for optometrists to be um, called in um, outside of work, meaning that um, things happen and the patients are calling us because something happened with their eye? When do you think that would be the time of year? OK, so you got a couple of things in your head. And I'm going to tell you it's in the summer and it's during the 4th of July. That's when we're called the most because folks do crazy things with them firecrackers, okay? So you need to wear goggles <laughs> during, during 4th of July because that's when we get the most calls in is during the 4th of July, all right? So um, just keep that stuff in mind, all right? All right, so path to optometry. So how do we get here, okay? Um, come to, um, one, you're going to take, we have an admissions test called the optometry admissions test, very similar to the dental admissions test or what have you. So you take that, you will take the prerequisite courses in undergrad. So that would be your, uh, year of biology, a year of chemistry, a year of physics and so forth. Um, and then you would apply to optometry school. You would, um, take, um, a lot of, um, credit hours and heavy science-based credit hours in optometry school. And then after a while, I guess during your second, third, and fourth year, you'll start seeing patients or what have you do clinical rotations, externships, all that sort of thing. Um, we'll, you would also pass a national board examination. Um, so we have three parts to our national boards to obtain a state license. And the thing about national boards is this. You can make straight A's in optometry school, but if you don't pass national boards, you can't practice. So you want to make sure that you go to an optometry school that, that prepares you to pass national boards, okay? Um, just as a side note, SCO has 100% national boards passes rate. But anywho, so the option, you also have an option to put, complete a one-year residency. So I did my residency in pediatrics, but there's the full gamut. It's the same things of the different... Um, areas you can go into, there are residencies for that. So you have a primary care residency, you have ocular disease residency, you have uh, low vision, geriatrics, contact lens, what have you, right? And then each year we have to complete continuing education hours so that we stay on top of what's coming in the profession. Um, one of the things that they emphasize here at SCO is lifelong learning, meaning that once you become an optometrist, you got to still learn. Okay, and that's how uh, continuing education kind of comes into play with that. All right. Now, let's talk about the different schools and colleges of optometry. Now, this is a big slide and there's a lot in this slide. So I don't want to overwhelm you. I just want to give you an idea of the schools and colleges that are out there, their tuition, average GPA, average OAT, which is the optometry admissions test, how many apply, how many we, how many um, are admitted, and then the board's passage rate. So we got these for all the schools and colleges of optometry in, in the nation and one in Puerto Rico. Um, the third one down is SCO, okay? And so it gives you an idea of how much we cost our average GPA, and then our average optometry admissions test score. So the OAT ranges from 200 to 400, and so we are about an average of about a 330, okay? Um, the, um, the number that apply are about over 800 students apply, and we have 136 students in, our, um, in each class. OK, but our board's passage rate is 100 percent. So you can actually look at this whole thing, especially when Re um, Rebecca sends this slide to you. You can look at it, analyze it and get an idea of um, where SEO stands versus the other schools and colleges of optometry. OK. So SCO is located in Memphis, Tennessee, in the medical district. So what the medical district is, is it's several hospitals and um, medical educational facilities right next to each other. So really fun fact. So this area, so this is Southern College of Optometry here. The area right behind Southern College of Optometry is the hospital that Steve Jobs had his um, transplant. OK, so we're really like really close. Um, we are a single um, purpose 
private institutions. So what does that mean? All we do is optometry all day, all night. We don't have any other disciplines at Southern College of Optometry. Um, I will say that um, coming to SEO and doing my residency, I remember being so excited that SEO had an all optometry library. I know I was a geek, but I was so excited. I was like, it's all optometry here. This is so awesome. So it's just little stuff like that that makes it uh, makes SEO a jewel because, for example, financial aid. If you guys are on campus, you know how financial aid can be like very scary or it can be things happen or what have you. The financial aid system here is so much more seamless because they know how much it costs. Uh, they know how much it costs for if you have a family, if you have a husband, if you're rooming with somebody, what have you. They have all of that together, so they make it so much more seamless than what it is at other institutions. So, for example, um, registering for class. You don't really have to do anything. You just show up and they give you all your books. Like It's like so awesome because everybody does the same thing. So it makes things, um, makes your life a lot simpler. Um, we have what we, um, our clinic is called the Eye Center at Southern College of Optometry. It is over 70 exam lanes. So it means that we have one of the largest eye care facilities of its kind in the nation. Okay. And so what's pretty cool about SEO, we talked about national boards. And so with national boards, there's one part of national boards where you have to practice or you have to demonstrate doing an eye exam in front of someone grading you. And they do that in Charlotte, North Carolina. The cool thing about SCO is that they designated two exam lanes to replicate the exam lane in North Carolina so that our students, when they practice, they're going to be practicing on the exact same equipment, the exact same setup, so that they're more familiar with how things will go as they're practicing in Memphis before they leave for Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, how to be competitive. The big thing in being competitive is to apply early. Now, what does early mean? Our uh, application cycle starts July 1, okay? So applying early means July, August, September, October. November, December is more middle of the application cycle, which is not bad, but it's still more in the middle. If you wait until January, February, that's, at, that's towards the end of the application cycle. Now, why is this important? SEO has more scholarships than any offers more scholarships than any other optometry institution the way you get a scholarship is that the earlier you apply the better your chances are at getting it because if you wait too late even though you have great credentials those scholarships may have already been distributed to others okay so that's why you want to apply early submit all your documentation so we have a cast just like most other professions we have an optom cast submit all your stuff into there take the oat early now this is the caveat with the oat do not take it until you've completed all your prerequisites. Once you've completed your prerequisites for the OAT, please take it early. But do not try to take the OAT and you haven't taken organic chemistry. That's not how you do this, okay? Make sure you've taken all the courses that apply to the OAT, then take the OAT. All right. And then this is a big one. Gain as much diverse exposure to the optometric field as possible. This is where shadowing comes in. Shadow someone in the different practice settings in in um, primary care. Or, yeah. A private practice in a group practice in a retail practice in a VA hospital, what have you, so that the more exposure you get, the better you will have an idea about what optometry is really like. And so you can determine if that's what you really want to do. Last, uh, lastly, or second to last, excuse me, have a commitment to service. Now, what does this mean? We want applicants that not only care about the profession, but they care about the community. We want them to be able to get back, give back. And so this is a thing that we actually put it into our curriculum that we have students that give back. So we like to see that actually demonstrated prior to acceptance. And then the last thing is ask questions. I'm going to give you an inside tip. I don't care whichever profession you go into. If you're applying for something, ask a question, okay? Because you're not only interview we're not only interviewing you, you're interviewing us. So when you ask us questions, it lets us know that you're thinking about 
different areas and aspects of it to see if this is the best place for you, okay? And then the last thing, I told you we would come back to this right here. These are the eye structures, okay? So I want you to say, tell me, how many of you guys remember what this area is? I kind of feel like Dora the Explorer, you know? <laughs> 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 but anyway, <laughs> this area here we talked about, okay, can anybody remember what it is? It's the macula. Good job. Good job. Okay. How about this right here? What do you guys think this one is? It's connected to the brain, the optic nerve. Awesome. Now up here, the lighter vessel, what did we say that was? the artery good deal and the very last one so if that's the artery the dark one is good job the vein all right so that is our presentation if you have any questions or anything or want them to know more information you have our information there so um, thank you for your time and i will open it to if anybody has any questions well thank you dr dumas that was a lot of fun i like that i learned a lot i don't know about you guys um, so we'll take just a few questions. We'll hang out for a minute or two. Feel free to type your questions in to the box. Um, I see one right now. Let's take a look. Okay, so this question is, do residencies require that you perform research in whatever specialty you've chosen? Okay, so um, it depends on the residency. Um, there, there isn't a requirement of research per, per se, but there will be a requirement for a um, paper that is submittable to a journal. So sometimes people will do research to have that particular uh, paper or what have you. Um, I think I did mine on a case report or something like that. So it just all depends. There are residencies out there that are two-year residencies that are a, um, a, a affiliated with a master's program. With those residencies, there is a research requirement there. So it just depends on which uh, avenue you choose with your residency. All right, the next question is, how do you suggest getting shadowing hours? Okay, so when I did shadowing, I looked it up in the phone book for an optometrist and called them up. So you can see how long ago that was. So all I would really do is the first person I would start with is your personal optometrist. When you go home or what have you, or if you're in the same city, just call them up and say, hey, I'm interested in being an optometrist. Can you, can I shadow in your office? And if they allow you to, awesome. And then after you do that, ask them about if they have any other colleagues that may be in a different mode of practice that they can refer you to, to ask for uh, shadowing opportunities and stuff. That's what I would do. Yeah, that's great. And a couple of related questions. How many shadowing hours do you expect for a student trying to get into SEO? And what kind of shadowing hours do students normally do? Um, I'm going to be really honest with you. Um, I think the shadowing hours is about 40 or so, but I'm not as concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is how many times have you gone there? Did you get the experience that you were looking for? Did you try to find another place? What I look for when a student comes is, all right, you shadowed at this office. How many, um, or how long did you shadow there? If you shadowed there one day, that's cool. But if you shadowed there one day for the whole semester, that looks better. You kind of see what I'm saying? Or if you took a Saturday, um, one Saturday out the month and shadowed in a different area or something like that. Just that variety is more what I'm looking for versus do you have 39 or 40 hours, if that makes any sense, okay? Definitely. Um, what qualifications do optometry school professors usually have? For example, what would I need to do if I wanted to practice for a while and then go back and teach? Oh, that's so <laughs> awesome. So. Optometry professors, to teach in an uh, academic institution, you have to have an OD degree, and then um, you do a residency, okay? And once you do that residency, that actually gives you the credentials to become a uh, faculty, all right? 
Um, very rarely will you see somebody that's in academia that has not done a residency, all right? Um, sometimes they'll do a, a two-year residency, so they have their master's too. There's other optometrists that will um, become a professor and then go back to school and get some more degrees behind their name. But for the most part, as long as you get your residency, then you are um, qualified to teach. So if you decide to go out and practice and then come back, as long as you have that residency, you're good to go. All right, guys, any other questions out there? These are good questions. Mm -hmm. All right, well, um, as Dr. Dumas said, we have our contact information there for you. You can reach out to us anytime. I would also recommend, if, if y'all haven't done so already, to hop onto our website. And we also have a new student portal. It's explore.sco dot edu explore .seo .edu. that will allow you to create your own um, little profile um, it's a micro site technically is what we call it and it adapts to where you're at and your consideration process and application process and gives you relevant information um, to where you are at so it's a really cool thing and it also allows you to keep in touch with us and hear from us when we have upcoming webinars and admissions events and you know, we give you suggestions about prereqs and all sorts of good stuff like that. So explore.seo.edu, go on. You'll have to fill out your information. That's how we keep in touch with you. But then you have that micro site to revisit um, as often as you want to. I saw another question. Um, okay, this question is, what would be the benefit of getting a dual degree? I'm personally interested in pursuing an OD slash MBA or an OD slash MPH? What would each of these offer open up? Okay, so dual degrees. Let's talk about OD, MPH. So in a, getting a master's in public health, it just opens your eyes more so to what's going on in the, in the community and how optometrists can help um, service our patients better. The big thing is that you can probably get into realms of either consulting or in community um, outreach projects. Um, it just expands your um, circumference of influence, so to speak, okay? Um, as far as the MBA, where that goes is it helps you with business, definitely, because it's a master's of business administration, but then it also helps you to uh, have practice management skills that you can not only use in your practice, but then you can act as a consultant to other optometrists in their practice. So it gives you more um, leverage, so to speak, in influencing not only how you run your practice, but helping others to um, run their practice at helping your colleagues to run their practice at the uh, highest rate possible or what have you. So there, those are definitely um, ways that optometrists have expanded their uh, circle of influence in eye care. All right, great. And then another question, when it comes to GPA, do y'all focus more on GPA or on how well-rounded a person is? Okay, so this is what I want you to think about with admissions, okay? With admissions, we're just trying to determine, are you going to succeed in our program? Okay, and so what we look at is we look at the whole applicant, we look at each piece of the puzzle, and we determine if, yeah, this person will probably succeed, or you know what, up to this point, we haven't seen things that demonstrate they will succeed in our program. Now, this is the thing too. When you get to optometry school, you're gonna take at least 23, 24, maybe even 25 credit hours in science. Let that sink in. That's a lot. So you want to be sure that, we want to be sure that when you come to SEO, you're gonna still be, you're gonna survive. Cause once you come to SEO, we're trying to make sure you graduate. We don't do weed out, okay? And so when we, what we're looking at is in the whole applicant, their GPA, their OAT, their community service, their um, shadowing experience, will it show that they're going to succeed in optometry school? So do we like a high GPA? Of course, but if your GPA is a little bit lower, but your OAT is solid, then you're still um, 
a, a good candidate because it says that you know the work enough to do well on the OAT, if that makes any sense. So do the best you can. I want you to understand all that you can, but it's more well, it's more holistic versus just one particular item, if that makes sense. And to add to that from an admissions perspective, having the aptitude to survive optometry school is, is important. But if we get a candidate who has a great GPA and has a good OAT, but they're not able to communicate, mm -hmm. um, that person isn't going to be admitted. So we do need the, the whole package in terms of um, you know, seeing someone who can succeed academically, but also who's committed, who has mm -hmm. perseverance, and who can demonstrate they have the ability to communicate. Because that's important not only for the program, but also, of course, in your, your future mm -hmm. career, you got to be able to com communicate with your professionals, or with your patients, excuse me. So mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's what we're looking for, yes. It is a little bit more of a holistic perspective. Um, I see another question. Do you have any programs so we could see how classes uh, typically go? Um, or do you recommend any programs? I, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean just sitting in in class or do you mean, um, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Can you elaborate a little bit? And then if you could elaborate and while, while you elaborate, um, there's another question. What would you recommend um, someone if they are considering or debating between optometry and med school? You touched on that a little bit. But. So when I was a junior in college, I went back and forth between dentistry, psychology, and optometry. And I got into a program where I could do some research or what have you, and I got to ask more questions. And so then I brought it down to dentistry and optometry. So I shadowed a dentist and I shadowed an optometrist. And when I did both of those, I saw myself doing what the optometrist did. Even though the dentist was cool, I didn't see myself doing that. I resonated more with the optometrist. So that's why I went to the optometry route. What you would, what I would suggest you do is find a, a MD that in a field that you're interested in and see if you can shadow and find an optometrist and see if you can shadow. That way you'll get a feel for which which career is the best path for you. OK. All right. We had a, a response. Um, the question was about, you know, um, like summer programs for undergrads. Yeah. So I do have a. A summer program for undergrads called um, Eye on Success. And it is a short program, but you will get to get exposure or you get submersed in what it's like to be an optometry student. Okay. And in that program, you will shadow in the clinic, you will do different eye activities, you will do um, uh, eye procedures on each other, and then you will also get to sit and um, shadow in different classrooms and stuff to see what it's like to be a student, okay? So, uh, but it's not a long program, it's less than a week, it's like three, four days, but it gives you enough um, information about what it's like to be a student, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. We also have a regular tour appointments or the ability to schedule you for a visit to campus if you'd like to come up or down or over. Uh, so we would set you up to go on a tour that would be led by one of our current students. So you have the chance to chat with, with him or her as well. And then uh, sit down with an admissions counselor to talk more about the program and admissions process and that sort of thing. And so we can work around whatever your schedule is so long as we have students that are available to give the tour. So we just have to avoid, you know, Christmas, um, <laughs> holiday breaks, uh, other breaks, and, and major test weeks. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is we also have a, a biannual visit program. So every other March, um, we have a campus visit day that's that we advertise and anyone's welcome to come. So we won't have one in 2019, the next one will be 2020. Um, all right, and we will take one last question. The question is, what are your thoughts on taking a gap year after graduating undergrad? I say, do what's best for you. If you feel that a gap year is what you need to collect your thoughts and get your mind right for optometry school, so be it. It's not looked 
negatively or it's not looked super positively either. It's just, it is what it is. So I say, if a gap year is what you feel you need, then go for it. I think that um, the, um, the more mentally prepared you are for optometry school, the better. So if that's what you need to do after undergrad, so be it. If that's a way for you to get more experience, go for it. Um, I think that it's an individual decision because a gap year isn't good for everybody. But if that's what you feel that you need to do, go for it. All right, guys. Well, these are really great questions. I appreciate it. And we appreciate that you're all here listening to us chat. Um, like I said, we'll post this on YouTube. I'll share the slides with everyone who registered. I hope you keep in touch with us. Uh, we're both happy to chat with you anytime if you have more questions, if you want to talk about your situation or what you're going through or get some personal insights. Um, we can chat with you. We can also put you in touch with students from SCO so you can chat with them. Um, so whatever would be helpful for you. And we do these uh, these webinars pretty regularly. We'll take a break in December since it's um, nearing our winter break and final exam period and all that. But we'll resume in January. And of course, if you have suggestions for topics you want to hear us talk about, we're always happy to entertain those because we want to give you information that's most relevant to you. Um, so again, thank you. Keep in touch and we hope to see you on a future webinar. Have a good one, y'all. All right. Thank you.